Good morning, good afternoon. This is Galen Barbos with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, welcome to today's webinar where we will be presenting findings from a report issued just last week uh, by Berkeley Lab and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Uh, the report evaluates the benefits and impacts of renewable portfolio standards in the United States. And this work was, was funded by the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Uh, before getting started, a, a few housekeeping items I'd like to go through. Uh, first, the webinar is being recorded, and both the recording and slides will be available afterwards, and we'll provide a web address at the end of the presentation where you can, can download these items uh, along with the, the report itself and a short fact sheet. Uh, we've scheduled today's webinar for about 90 minutes. <clears throat> the presentation itself should, should really only take about 45 or 50 minutes, and then we can devote the, the remainder of the time to Q&A. All of you are in listen-only mode though, so you can submit your questions via the, the chat window that you see on your computer screen. <clears throat> and we would definitely encourage you to do so during the course of the presentation. We'll be reviewing and compiling those questions as we go, and then get them queued up for the Q&A portion at, at the end. <clears throat> uh, one last item that I wanted to mention is that, that this work really involved the collaboration of a large number of researchers from, from both labs. Uh, you'll hear from a few of us today in particular. I'll be handing the mic to Ryan Weiser shortly who will take us through the bulk of the slide deck. And then both Jenny Heater from NREL and myself will interject at a few points. Um, most of the other report co-authors uh, are on the line as well though, and, and potentially you'll be hearing from some of them during the Q&A. So with that, Ryan, why don't you take it away? Ryan, you're on mute perhaps. I am indeed. Sorry about that. Um, good morning or good afternoon all. This is Ryan Weiser here. Pleasure to be here as well to provide a, a summary, somewhat in-depth summary indeed of uh, this report released, uh, a retrospective analysis of the benefits and impacts of U.S. renewables portfolio standards. Uh, in terms of the organization of the present presentation today, I'm going to begin with a bit of an overview and background and scope, kind of building off of some of the remarks that Galen just made. And then I'm going to turn it back to Galen to talk about some of the foundational data and analysis that we conducted that helps as an input to really all of, of the subsequent analysis. I'll then be clicking uh, through the six different benefit and impact categories that we analyzed as part of this report, greenhouse gas emissions, air pollution emissions, water use, growth jobs and economic development, wholesale electricity prices, and natural gas prices, provide a couple of quick conclusions, and then turn it over to Jenny Heater with the National Renewable Energy Lab who will provide a, a bit of a, an introduction to some planned work that we hope to execute, or we will be executing in fact here in fiscal year and calendar year 2016 as a follow-up to the work that we'll be describing today. Uh, we do have a ton to, to go through here. We're going to be geeking out a little bit here. I apologize. Uh, lots of slides to go through. We won't be really pausing on any individual slide to really walk everyone on the call through each individual figure and this sort of thing. But let me assure you that all of the content in the presentation today is also available uh, online. The full report, of course, is available. Uh, a short two-page fact sheet associated with the report is available, and this briefing largely in equivalent form to that which I will be presenting or we will be presenting today is also available for all of your perusal. Um, this slide just describes on a very basic level some of the goals of the work that we'll be going through today. Uh, the primary goal was to evaluate the potential benefits and impacts of state RPS programs and to do so wherever possible in monetary terms, to try to quantify uh, the monetary or dollar value of some of those benefits and impacts. And we specifically had a retrospective view here, focusing on the annual benefits in the year 2013, which is the most recent year for which we had the full set of data available to conduct this work. 
Uh, this work is very much a follow-up to work conducted in 2014 and led by uh, Jenny Heater and Galen Barbos that looked primarily at RPS compliance costs. And so we are trying to look at the other side of the coin here, focusing on the benefits and impacts of state RPS programs, again also with a retrospective view. We are very much leveraging not only the extraordinary team of analysts that were originally employed in a DOE wind vision study, but also relying upon many of the same methods and tools that we developed and employed in that study which came out uh, early last year. So thanks to the DOE WIND program for supporting the development of many of the tools and methods and indeed team members that were critical to the study that we're talking about today. And then finally, uh, we will be uh, taking quite a lot of care both in the report and also in the presentation today to try to highlight some of the caveats, limitations, and uncertainties in the work that we will be presenting. Our coverage, as I mentioned before, are on six different benefit and impact categories. I won't read those off again. And ultimately, our intended audiences are twofold. First, of course, we want to provide or help provide a framework and methodology that states might <coughs> use and build upon to conduct their own and perhaps refined analysis of the benefits and impacts of their individual state RPS programs, or also with a broader audience hoping to communicate aspects of the value of state RPS programs to inform decision making at the state level. A bit more background here, as Galen mentioned, this work uh, was supported by the DOE EERE Strategic Programs Office, thanks to Steve Capanna uh, for supporting this work in particular. Uh, it was executed by a large group of just extraordinary analysts. You're mostly going to be hearing from me, uh, from Galen, and from Jenny today. Uh, but really much of the core work was conducted by the other folks on this list. Uh, True Mai, Lori Bird, Mark Bollinger, Alberta Carpenter, Garvin Heath, David Kaiser, Jordan Macknick, Andrew Mills, and Deb Milstein. Many of those folks are on the call here, so any hard uh, questions they will hopefully help answer. Uh, towards the end of this presentation. Uh, this work is part of a multi-year effort uh, conducted by NREL and LBL to assess the benefits, costs, and impacts of state RPS programs, both retrospectively and prospectively. I mentioned a moment ago this 2014 study that Galen and Jenny led uh, that primarily focused on state-level estimates of RPS compliance costs here in 2015 for the study that was just released uh, but conducted in 2015. We focused on this retrospective analysis of potential benefits and impacts. And Jenny will talk a little bit later, really at the end of the presentation, I suppose, about work planned for 2016 and somewhat more tentatively for 2017 as well. As I mentioned earlier, we do take a considerable amount of care to fully describe our approach and methods as well as the related caveats and limitations. We'll be doing that for each of the individual benefit and impact categories uh, as we go through each of those individual benefit and impact categories. But on this slide, I've included sort of a laundry list of, uh, of broader cross-cutting caveats and limitations, things that define what is in our scope for this study and what is our, kind of out of our scope for the purpose of this work. The first thing to note here that we do apply a uniform set of methods nationally. What that means practically is that this study looks at the collective or aggregate potential benefits of all of the state RPS programs in total. So we're looking at the national, regional, and state impacts associated with the aggregated set of state RPS programs. We're not trying to present the impacts of any individual state RPS programs. We're looking at the collective impact of all of them. There is, of course, with any such assessment, a certain level of uncertainty involved. We do quantify a subset of those uncertainties, but in other cases we simply describe the uncertainties without trying to quantify them in uh, physical or monetary units. We do try to distinguish between the benefits of RPS programs and their impacts. We'll get into that in a little bit more detail as we get into each of the individual six categories. 
Uh, we do cover, uh, as mentioned before, an important set of six different benefit and impact categories, but by no means are those all of the benefits and impacts associated with RPS programs. So we acknowledge that we're not covering every possible benefit or impact category in this analysis. Our analysis here does not really consider costs. Uh, that was the focus of the 2014 work. It will also be a partial focus of the 2016 work. But for the purpose of the study that we're releasing or that we did release and that we're talking about today, we're really focused on the benefits and impacts component of that work. We acknowledge that RPS programs may or may not be the least cost way of achieving the benefits and impacts here. And similarly, we recognize that renewable energy that supports state RPS programs is of course partly motivated by those programs, but might also be motivated by a wide range of other drivers as well, federal tax incentives, uh, underlying cost reductions for the renewable technologies, et cetera. And so our focus in this analysis is looking at the benefits and impacts of new renewable energy that was used to meet RPS programs in 2013. But we acknowledge that there may be multiple drivers to that renewable energy beyond the RPS programs. Uh, in the spirit of uh, putting the cart before the horse here, this slide summarizes the core results of our analysis across all six benefit and impact categories. I'm not going to discuss this slide in detail here. Obviously, we'll get to each of these benefit and impact categories here just in a bit, but suffice it to say that we do find significant benefits and impacts from RPS programs in the 20, 2013 timeframe. Greenhouse gas emissions reductions, reductions in criteria air pollution, reductions in water use, and significant impacts in terms of jobs, wholesale electricity prices, and natural gas. Again, we'll get into the details here in a moment. There is uncertainty in the benefits across each of those individual categories. That being said, if one just focuses on greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution emissions reductions, our central estimates are about $7.4 billion of societal benefits in terms of achieving the RPS programs in 2013. And if one tries to compare that with the work that I described earlier, completed in 2014, the compiled state-level compliance costs, those state-level compliance costs equate on average to about a billion dollars a year. So the benefits in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and criteria air pollution emissions, at least in our central case estimates, line up pretty favorably to previous estimates of uh, average compliance costs. And with that uh, background and kind of brief description of our goals and approach and even a little bit of a preview of our results, uh, we're now going to delve into the details of our analysis. We're going to start with Galen Barbos describing some of the foundational data and analysis that we required and that underlied all of the subsequent analysis. And after Galen talks, I will then click through each of those benefit and impact categories in turn. So over to you, Galen. Okay. Thanks, Ryan. So um, I'm going to talk about several of these kind of key foundational uh, data elements to the overall project. Uh, one of the sort of more central underlying foundational elements was some modeling that we performed with EPA's AVERT model to estimate displaced fossil generation and emissions associated with RPS resources. And so the, the inputs to the AVERT model, which I'll, I'll talk a bit, about, uh, a bit more about on the next slide, uh, those inputs consist of hourly profiles of the RPS generation delivered to each of the 10 AVERT regions shown in the map here. Uh, the model then takes that input data and estimates changes in generation, fuel consumption, and emissions of NOx, SO2, and carbon dioxide for each individual fossil generating unit in each of those regions. Um, and so those, those outputs from the AVERT model are represented in the schematic by the, the four blue rectangles. Um, and each of those outputs then feed into one or more of the various benefit and impact analyses uh, as indicated by, by the red letters there, um, which are kind of described in the key on the right-hand side. Um, 
So uh, I want to back up a little bit and talk about the data on RPS generation that was used as, as an input to the AVERT modeling. And that data also feeds uh, directly into many of the benefit and impact analyses as well. So first on, on data sources, we compiled this in information mostly from RPS compliance filings issued by individual utilities and PUCs, uh, as well as from, from REC tracking systems and other uh, largely public data sources. Uh, there were a number of important conventions or, or filters that we applied to this data uh, and that warrant some emphasis here. Uh, so the first is that we focused solely on new renewable electricity. That is, we counted only generation from renewable uh, facilities that were constructed after the date of RPS enactment uh, in the states where, where that, that renewable generation is being used for RPS compliance. Um, so that's kind of filter number one. Number two is that we also excluded any excess RPS procurement. So some utilities and states are ahead of schedule and in 2013 had procured more renewable electricity or more RECs than were strictly needed for their compliance obligations in that year. But we only counted for the purpose of this analysis what was strictly necessary for their, their obligations in that year. Uh, we also excluded any non-renewable resources uh, such as energy efficiency or, or fossil-based com uh, combined heat and power that, that may have been used to meet RPS compliance obligations in some states. Um, fourth, we um, unfortunately had to exclude Hawaii from this analysis because AVERT does not uh, include Hawaii. Um, and then the last item that I'll mention here is that um, when, when tallying up all these renewable megawatt hours, um, we did take care to account for uh, some of the interregional trade across regions. Um, and in particular, um, we needed to make sure that we kept track and accounted for situations where uh, one state might be using renewable energy certificates generated by a facility in some other uh, avert region without physical delivery of the generation. And that's important because the displacement of fossil generation occurs in the region where the renewable electricity is being delivered to. And so that was just one of the, the complexities that, that we had to account for in this analysis. Um, so given those various criteria, we're looking at just under 100 terawatt hours of new renewable electricity used to meet RPS compliance obligations in 2013. Um, and that represents about 2.4% of total uh, U.S. electricity generation in that year. And the charts at the bottom of the slide just break that total out by technology type and by, by state and region. And now the, the fossil generation displaced by those resources are shown, is shown on the slide here. Um, this is of course what we estimated using AVERT. And in total to, uh, fossil generation displaced by these RPS resources uh, works out to about 3.6% of total U.S. Uh, fossil generation in 2013. Um, and that displaced fossil generation was split almost evenly between gas and coal, uh, at least at a national level, though you can see uh, in the, the figure on the left-hand side that that split, of course, varies quite a bit from region to region depending upon the underlying mix of, of fossil generation. Um, so lastly, let me just briefly mention one other set of foundational data elements. Uh, so two of the benefit and impact analyses, namely uh, life cycle greenhouse gas emissions and jobs and economic development, those two uh, analyses required information not only about RPS generation, but also uh, RPS capacity additions. And so to generate that foundational data, we looked at uh, annual average renewable capacity additions over the 2013 to 2014 time frame. And we counted only those renewable capacity additions where the off-taker uh, of either the renewable electricity or the RECs uh, was subject to an RPS. So that was kind of our, our screening criterion there. Um, and we took the average over this two-year period both in order to smooth out some of the lumpiness in underlying renewable capacity build, um, but also because much of the capacity that came online in 2014 
uh, it was under development in, in 2013. Um, so based on, on this approach, uh, we're looking at an average of about 5,600 megawatts of RPS-driven renewable capacity additions per year over that two-year time frame. And that's what's shown in the figure on this slide where you can see about half of the total was utility-scale PV, um, and much of that was, was physically located in California. Uh, we then estimate that about 2,500 megawatts of new fossil capacity was or will be displaced by those renewable capacity additions. And that information about displaced fossil capacity then uh, feeds into, albeit in a relatively minor way, uh, the estimate of life cycle greenhouse gas uh, reductions. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand the mic back to Ryan who will then take us through each of the six individual benefit and impact analyses. Ryan? Thank you, Galen. And uh, I will do just that, going through each of the six in turn. I should note before we launch into these that for each of the six benefit and impact categories, I'll start with a little bit of a discussion uh, of background. Uh, though that perhaps is not completely necessary for the folks on this webinar. And so I will aim to go through that pretty quickly. Similarly, I will go through the methods uh, relatively quickly and then discuss the results of our analysis, again, for each of the six benefit and impact categories in turn. Uh, I do very much want to acknowledge my co-authors here. Uh, I, in fact, led none of these six benefit and impact categories. You can see that my name is associated with some of them, less so than others. Uh, but we do have a variety of just tremendous analysts that focused on each of these individual benefit and impact categories. Hopefully I will do their work a bit of justice, uh, and any hard questions will most certainly need to go to them. So let's start with greenhouse gas emissions and climate change damage reduction benefits, work that was led by NREL, Garvin Heath, and Alberta Carpenter, with some work on my side as well. Uh, here the context is pretty straightforward and certainly well known among this particular webinar group. Of course, scientists do predict significant changes to the climate due to greenhouse gas emissions. Renewable technologies have low greenhouse gas emissions uh, when considering all life cycle stages, so considering upstream materials, delivery, as well as operations and decommissioning. And so for the purpose of this benefit category, we try to estimate those potential life cycle greenhouse gas emissions benefits of RPS compliance, and then we quantify the value of those reductions in mitigating the severity of climate change related damages. A little bit more specifically, we take combustion related CO2 emissions directly from the AVERT analysis that Galen just described. Then, based on a meta-review and analysis of the available literature, Garvin Heath and Alberta Carpenter estimated the upstream GHG emissions from other life cycle stages, both for the renewable technologies that are being deployed as well as the fossil technologies that are being displaced. And then we value those life cycle emissions reductions based on a range of social cost of carbon estimates. The social cost of carbon reflects the impact or the estimated impact of global climate change on agricultural productivity, human health, property damages, and ecosystem services. And ultimately, we rely on a range of social cost of carbon estimates for the year 2013, all from the U.S. Interagency Working Group and all used within the context of federal rulemakings uh, on uh, climate change or in areas that uh, intersect with climate change, and you can see what the value of those dollar per ton estimates are in the bullet in the upper right-hand corner of this slide. A variety of other caveats and limitations here that in the interest of time I will not describe, uh, but that are highlighted in the full report. Uh, ultimately, we find that the life cycle emissions reductions associated with RPS compliance in the year 2013 total 57 million metric tons. Uh, you can see how that breaks out into different life cycle stages in the left-hand figure here that I won't go through in detail other than to say that avoided combustion-related emissions is the primary driver here. 
And you can see in the map on the right-hand side of this slide that those combustion-related emissions reductions are somewhat concentrated in portions of the Great Lakes area, uh, the Mid-Atlantic region, and Texas, California, Colorado, and Washington. This, of course, is driven in part by the location of renewable energy projects serving RPS programs, but also, as or more importantly, the type and location of the fossil generation that is being displaced by those sources. If we value the life cycle emissions reductions uh, based on the social cost of carbon, we develop a pretty wide range of benefits in the year 2013 ranging from $0.7 billion to $6.3 billion, but based on the IWG's central estimate for the social cost of carbon, we estimate a $2.2 billion benefit from RPS compliance in that year. To provide a little bit of context of what that $2.2 billion equates to in terms of cents per kilowatt hour, you can see at the bottom of this particular slide that at least in the central estimate, that $2.2 billion is equivalent to 2.2 cents per kilowatt hour of renewable energy. So every kilowatt hour of renewable energy, new renewable energy, serving state RPS programs in the year 2013 had a benefit in terms of global climate change damage reduction of 2.2 cents per kilowatt hour. Moving on to benefit category number two here, air pollution emissions and human health and environmental benefits. Here the context is uh, also relatively straightforward. As everyone knows, combusting fuel to generate electricity does produce air pollutants. Those air pollutants harm human health and cause environmental damage. Of course, all sources, including renewable sources, do have important environmental impacts, but renewable sources oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes have uh, no direct and low life cycle air pollution emissions. For the purpose of this benefit category, we calculate the potential air emissions reductions associated with state RPS compliance in the year 2013, and then we present the associated public health and environmental uh, benefits from those reductions. We again start with the ABERT output that Galen described a little earlier. Uh, we then, though, have to add back in uh, biomass-related air pollution emissions, which are not otherwise considered uh, in ABERT. And then we calculate the health and environmental impacts and monetized benefits of the net emissions reductions using a variety of tools. We use the EPA COBRA model which develops both a low and a high estimate for the uh, health-related benefits of renewable energy. We also use the same set of tools that EPA relied upon in the Clean Power Plan, which similarly comes up with a range of benefit estimates from a low estimate to a high estimate, again, based on different uh, epidemiological literature. Uh, that uh, has differences of opinion in terms of the translation between exposure to pollutants and the impact of that exposure on health outcomes. And then finally, we use a model developed by a group of academics called AP2. Ultimately, we do focus on just a subset of air pollution impacts, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, and uh, fine particulate matter, or PM2.5. And we really focus almost exclusively on the implications of these pollutant emissions on fine particulate exposure and ozone exposure. This next slide presents the physical results or the physical impacts associated with our analysis. You can see a displacement of, not surprisingly, all three pollutants, and you can also see the location of that displacement and the location tends to be concentrated in the Midwest region, in the Mid-Atlantic region, in the Great Lakes, and in Texas. Um, and this, of course, is driven in part, again, where renewables are located, but more importantly here, are really driven by where higher polluting coal plants are located. If we then translate those emissions reductions into health and environmental outcomes and translate those outcomes into monetary terms, we estimate a range of benefits across the five different uh, benefit estimates of 2.6 to 9.9 .9 billion dollars. The central estimate is 5.2 billion. 
with uh, an equivalent cent per kilowatt hour value of renewable energy of 5.3. Most of those benefits do come from a reduction in sulfur dioxide emissions, and in particular, the reduction in premature mortality associated with the reduced exposure to fine sulfate particles. Uh, most of those benefits accrue in the eastern half of the country, and especially in the northeastern region, again, driven in large measure by where more polluting coal plants exist and where human populations are exposed to pollutants from those coal plants that are being displaced as a result of the RPS programs. Turning to uh, a third benefit category, water use uh, reduction benefits. Uh, here it goes without saying that the electric sector is, of course, heavily dependent on water, primarily for thermal cooling. For the purpose of this analysis, we focus on two potential, potential kinds of electric sector water uh, impacts. One, water withdrawals, the amount of water removed or diverted by a water source, but oftentimes then returned to that water source for the purpose of power plant cooling. And then separately, look, we look at water consumption. So this is the amount of water that is not only withdrawn, but ultimately removed from the local water environment through evaporation uh, or through other, uh, other um, pathways. Many renewable technologies do have low water use compared to fossil and nuclear technologies, though that's not true in all cases. And so for the purpose of this uh, category, we're calculating the potential net water withdrawal and consumption benefits of RPS compliance. Uh, our methods, again, rely primarily on ABERT and, in particular, matching ABERT-related plant-level displacement effects with uh, power plant-level water use intensity estimates, and we use those to then quantify the national, regional, and temporal net water use reductions associated with RPS compliance. We are focused here on operational water withdrawal and consumption, and we're considering both displacement of fossil and nuclear assets, but also the water use required by renewable energy projects. For the purpose of this benefit category, uh, we are not able to calculate benefits in monetary terms. Uh, standardized methods simply don't exist to do so at this point, and so we describe the benefits in physical terms quantify them in physical terms, and then discuss the benefits qualitatively, but we don't try to quantify them in dollar value uh, terms here. Uh, based on the methods I just described very briefly, we estimate that RPS programs in the year 2013 reduced net water withdrawals by 830 billion gallons, net water consumption by 27 billion gallons. Both of those represent roughly 2% of uh, power sector water withdrawals and consumption. Now, of course, water use is largely a regional issue, more a regional issue than a national issue. And so it is important to understand where those withdrawal and consumption reductions are occurring. And of course, they're not uniform. They vary by state, impacted by the amount, location, and type of renewable generation, as well as by the location and type of fossil displacement. That said, as you can see in the graphics here, we do see significant water use reductions in a number of drought-prone regions. And in fact, the largest withdrawal savings are found to exist in California, and the largest consumption savings in the state of Texas. As I mentioned before, we aren't able, unfortunately, to calculate the monetary value of those reductions, but we're certainly able to describe some of the benefits associated with them, including reducing the vulnerability of electricity supply to the availability and temperature of water, freeing up water uh, for other potential productive or local environmental or ecosystem uh, use, as well as avoiding upstream water demands from fossil fuel supply, which may alleviate other energy sector impacts on water resource quantity and quality. Okay, so turning now from environmental considerations to ones that are more economic in nature, and also in this case from benefits to what we term as impacts, 
I'm going to begin by discussing our assessment uh, by David Kaiser of the gross renewable energy jobs associated with RPS compliance in the year 2013. And then I'll follow that with a discussion of our analysis of wholesale and natural gas price suppression. Starting with jobs and economic development, though, I think it's uh, pretty self-evident that renewable electricity generation infrastructure requires workers and expenditures, and that those workers and expenditures can occur on site, they can occur throughout the manufacturing supply chain, or they can be induced by the expenditures of folks who are otherwise involved on site or within the supply chain in their local economy. There's been a considerable amount of research to quantify both the gross and net impacts of renewables deployment on jobs and economic development. That literature, uh, of course, does find that renewable energy can increase renewable energy jobs or gross jobs within the renewables sector. But especially if you're looking at a national or international scale, claims that there is a net, that there are a net increase in jobs are somewhat more problematic. Sure, increasing renewables deployment increases renewable energy jobs, but it may displace jobs in the fossil sector, for example. And so especially when considering things on a national or international scale, one has to be a little bit careful in claiming net impacts. That notwithstanding, our analysis focused on the gross domestic jobs and other economic impacts supported by RPS programs. We focus on, in effect, the jobs motivated by the renewable sector. We do not analyze with our methods used here the offsetting jobs that occur elsewhere in the economy, and that is why we do not claim this to be a, a net societal benefit, but instead focus on the gross impacts of RPS programs on jobs. Our methods here rely upon principally a set of JEDI tools, basically input-output models developed by folks at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And so we take data in terms of the, the renewable generation and capacity serving or meeting RPS programs in the 2013 timeframe and run that generation and capacity through these input-output tools ultimately developing estimates of gross jobs on site throughout the supply chain and induced, and both for the operation of renewable projects as well as their construction. The results of that analysis are shown here. Bottom line, we find that RPS programs in the year 2013 supported roughly 200,000 gross domestic jobs, each of them earning an average annual salary of about $60,000. You can see in the graphic in the lower left-hand side of this particular slide how those total 200,000 jobs break down between the supply chain on-site and induced by technology and also between construction and O&M. And then just for the on-site jobs, you can see where the location of those jobs are. We don't try to assign jobs that are related or that are throughout the supply chain or induced by state, but at least for the on-site jobs, you can see where there are, those are located. As a side note, I would mention that a lot of the new renewables capacity coming online in 2013 and 2014 was solar photovoltaic plants in California. And you can see, therefore, in the left-hand figure, the dominance of solar PV, and in the right-hand figure, that you can't see it exactly in this figure, there's a significant dominance of California in the year 2013 as well. Uh, turning now to uh, wholesale electric price reduction benefits, uh, the issue here is that with growing amounts of renewable energy, we can push out the wholesale electric power supply curve, an impact that has often been termed the so-called merit order effect. And in the short run, that merit order effect, that shift in the supply curve can reduce wholesale market clearing prices in wholesale electric power markets. And to the extent that consumer electricity bills are affected by those wholesale electric market prices, we can also reduce uh, consumer electricity bills. And for, so for the purpose of this analysis, we're trying to quantify the potential impact of RPS programs on both wholesale electricity prices and how those then translate into consumer savings in terms of consumer electricity bills. 
Again, I want to acknowledge that this is more of an impact than a benefit, or said differently, whether it is a benefit or a cost depends on one's perspective. If you're an electricity consumer, you might well view your reduced electric bills as a benefit. If you are, on the other hand, a fossil generator, a nuclear generator, or even a renewable generator that is selling into the wholesale market, you may very much view this as a cost. It is reducing the profitability of the asset that you're selling into a wholesale market. It is, in effect, a transfer of wealth from generators to consumers. Uh, our method here, again, relies on ABERT. In the interest of time, I won't describe our methods in detail here, other than to note that there are two very important uncertainties in our analysis here. One of them is the rate of decay of this merit order effect. It's widely recognized that the merit order effect is to a degree temporary in nature, but there is a considerable amount of uncertainty about what temporary exactly means in terms of duration. In addition, uh, the degree to which electricity consumers are exposed to wholesale prices varies by region and itself is somewhat uncertain. A variety of utilities enter long-term contracts. Those long-term contracts may, at least in the short term, be unaffected by wholesale prices. So we had to rely upon a range of assumptions for both the decay of the effect and the degree to which consumers are exposed to wholesale price changes. As a result of those underlying uncertainties, we also find a pretty wide range of potential impacts here. Potential impacts that range from basically zero at the low end to a high of 1.2 billion on the high end. So a little bit unsatisfied here from uh, an analysis perspective, but the core thing to observe is that there's simply uh, considerable uncertainty in the assumptions that one might use both for the, the decay and also the portion of retail electricity that's purchased at the spot market. And so there are similar levels of uncertainty in our underlying estimates here. Uh, the final impact category that we focused on, led by a colleague here at LBL, Mark Bollinger, uh, was to try to assess the effect of state RPS programs in suppressing natural gas prices. Uh, the basic nature of this impact is somewhat similar to the one I just described in terms of the merit order effect within the wholesale power market, namely, as you increase renewable energy, you displace natural gas fire generation. That reduces demand for natural gas and thereby places downward pressure on natural gas prices. We therefore, the, for the purpose of this impact category, look at the potential impact of RPSs on those natural gas prices and then translate those natural gas price reductions into reductions in overall energy bills. Um, it is, again, important to recognize that this is more of a transfer payment than a societal benefit. Uh, clearly, those of us who use natural gas in our homes, industrial customers that use natural gas for industrial process use or otherwise will perceive this to be a benefit. If, on the other hand, you're a natural gas producer or a stockholder in a natural gas producing firm, you might very much view this impact as a cost, not as a benefit. Again, this is why we term it an impact. Again, in the interest of time, let me not belabor the point on all of our methods here. We do rely on uh, estimates from the Energy Information Administration in terms of the relationship between natural gas demand and natural gas prices, uh, and we apply those so-called inverse price elasticity estimates to the natural gas reductions that we estimated from AVERT. There is, as with the wholesale power price, work that I just presented, some uncertainty about how or when the decay in this effect begins. This is an effect that should persist over the long term, but it should decline to some degree over time. But exactly how that decline occurs and when it begins are uncertain. As a result of that uncertainty, we find a range of impacts here. In particular, we find that RPS, renewable serving RPS programs lowered gas prices by a range of 0.05 to 0.14 dollars per million BTU. When you apply that price reduction to all gas consuming uh, sectors of the economy, you can see consumer savings that range from 1.3 to 
to $3.7 billion in aggregate. So uh, with that, we are nearing the end of the presentation. Uh, to conclude, I will leave you with the same slide that I started with earlier, a slide that in infographic form presents many of the core results that I presented throughout the, this entire presentation. Again, as I mentioned early on in the presentation, it would appear that the benefits of state RPS programs stack up pretty well, at least with past estimates of RPS programs. And we hope in addition to just being able to demonstrate some of the potential benefits and impacts of RPS programs here, that we're able to lay out a set of methodologies, assumptions, and tools that states or others might build upon in order to conduct their own analysis within their own individual states. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Jenny Keeter, who will go over just this final slide in our presentation and describe a little bit of our plans for the year 2016. Jenny, take it away. Thanks, Ryan. Um, we just wanted to put a little bit of a teaser in about our upcoming work. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, this current benefits report is one in a series of reports. So we've already examined uh, both the costs and the benefits now of RPS policies retrospectively. But this year we'll be turning to the future potential benefits, impacts, and costs of RPS policies. Um, so we'll have ultimately one report that will cover benefits, impacts, and costs of uh, RPS policies in the future. Um, and to do this, we'll be using NREL's REEDS model. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, uh, it's an electric sector capacity expansion model, and it's the model that's been used uh, for a number of uh, large studies, including uh, studies like the Renewable Electricity Futures Study. Um, and True Mai of NREL will be leading that uh, REEDS component. So to look at RPSs in the future, um, we'll be running a few scenarios using that model. Um, the first uh, is basically a baseline scenario where we turn off RPSs in the model and see what happens. Um, the second scenario is more of a central RPS scenario where we look at current RPS policies um, as is. And then we'll have a, some sort of third scenario which looks at expanded RPS policies. And we're considering looking at that through the lens of what if RPS policies uh, fulfilled all of the Clean Power Plan obligations. Um, so that work is still being, being framed out um, and figuring out how to, how to model some of these things. Uh, so we're just getting started on this work and we'll be finalizing it over the next year. Um, so that's just a brief teaser of our current uh, current work and hope you guys will be engaged with that as well. And I'll turn it back over to you, Ryan. Great. And I think that we are now at the point of the Q&A. Uh, during the Q&A, we'll just kind of leave this slide up here. It identifies where the report can be located, both on the LBL and NREL web pages. Uh, it also includes the email addresses of uh, four of the authors, but not all of the other authors, though I assure you that if anybody asks any of the four of us listed here any hard questions, we will simply send you to the relevant expert on each of the individual benefit and impact categories. And so with that, I think we are ready for Q&A. I think Galen, you are going to kind of moderate and potentially also help answer the questions that we are receiving. Yep, that's right. So thanks to all of you for hanging in there so far. And um, thank you uh, to those who have submitted questions via the chat window. Um, if you have additional questions, I encourage you to submit them. We'll, we can kind of cull through them in, in real time as we work through the ones that we've already compiled. Uh, so let's see, I'm going to start out with there were a couple questions related to the avert analysis. Um, and maybe before answering one of the questions, I'll just give a little bit of additional background on that tool um, and, and what it does. And that background may then help to answer um, at least one of these questions. So the, the AVERT model is uh, essentially a spreadsheet tool built uh, for the EPA by Synapse Energy Economics, a consulting firm. And 
And you can think about it as being as doing something similar to what a production cost model might do, but in much more simplified form. And in effect, what this model does is it develops a set of, of statistical relationships between uh, the operation of individual fossil generation units and hourly loads in each region. And those statistical relationships are, are based on historical data for a particular year. Um, and then using those historical uh, statistical relationships, the model estimates how individual plants will change their operation given a particular change in load at a particular point in time. Uh, so that's basically how the model works. We had uh, one question here that, that really asked about um, the uh, ramping effects on fossil generation. In particular, the question asked, when calculating the reduction in CO2 emissions, was more frequent operation of thermal generation um, at, at minimal sustainable level and associated increase in CO2 emissions compared to baseload operation taken into account? Um, so this is, a, again, really a question about the kind of degradation in CO2 emission reductions associated with um, more frequent cycling um, or more severe cycling and less efficient operation of, of fossil generation as a result of renewables. Um, and I think the short answer to the question is, is the model does not fully or explicitly take that into account. Um, those effects, of course, are perhaps partially embedded within the historical data that the statistical relationships um, are, are derived from. Um, and so it's not wholly excluded from the analysis, but, but it certainly is not wholly included. Um, that being said, I think it's probably worth pointing out that, that we are looking at, a, at a, an historical year here, 2013, and we're looking at levels of renewable generation that at least at a national level are equal to about 2.5% of total U.S. generation, uh, though certainly larger in some regions. And um, at least based on analyses, in-depth in analyses of cycling impacts that have been done um, in the literature, I think it's safe to say that at least at the level of renewable generation that we consider for this analysis, those, those cycling effects are unlikely to really significantly degrade or impact the results that, that we've shown here. Um, so I think that, that's kind of a not exactly short answer, but an, an answer to, to that question. Um, we have another, and so uh, Ryan, Jenny, others, anything to add there before I move on to the next one? No. No, okay. So let me um, uh, move on to another question here. Um, and this one uh, relates to, again, to the, the uh, greenhouse gas reduction impacts and benefits. Um, and the question asks, uh, how does your estimate of the benefits um, from 0.7 to 6.4 cents per kilowatt hours. Um, how do those results compare to the estimate of the cost of carbon of $40 per ton of CO2? Uh, in other words, what cost of carbon uh, is assumed uh, in your analysis? So Ryan, I think this probably, yes, exactly, relates to this slide here. Yeah, so this slide shows the IWD social cost of carbon for the low, central, high, and higher than expected case. Um, I think the questioner was asking specifically about a kind of $40 per metric ton number. You can see that that is pretty darn consistent with the central case for, from the IWG for the year 2013. And, okay, and another question. This one relates to the jobs and economic development impacts analysis. And the question asks, how did you quantify manufacturing and supply chain jobs? Did you capture renewable electricity manufacturing that would occur in other states for RE projects that are installed in RPS states? So the the renewable manufacturing jobs, first of all, it's calculated at the national level. And that's why, for example, when uh, Ryan put up the slide uh, that, that had a map of where the impacts were, would actually occur, those were only the on-site ones that we attributed to specific states. So in as much as uh, the JEDI model has uh, manufacturing occurring in the United States as a default, 
Um, we included that, but we didn't attribute it to any specific U.S. geography. But for some technologies, that manufacturing, we really didn't count at all, uh, such as uh, solar photovoltaics. We just assumed that, that would be, the modules would be imported. All right, thanks. And was that, was that David? Yeah. Thanks, David. Um, okay, let's see. So here we have a question about the uh, wholesale price impact. Um, and really the question um, is, is rather broad and just asks uh, whether we can uh, speak more and elaborate on the decay factors and how those decay factors kind of may complicate the analysis for future prices. Yeah, this is Ryan again. Let me take this. I think Andrew is not able, and Mills, who conducted this part of the analysis, isn't able to be with us today. Um, so let me provide kind of a general answer, and then I'll, I can connect. If the questioner wants to shoot me an email, I can connect you with Andrew, who can provide a, a more thorough and detailed uh, answer. The, the basic idea of this decay and effect over time is that in the very near term, before new power plants can be built and before existing power plants can retire, that there is very much this merit order effect. That is, overall increases in renewable energy, in a decrease overall wholesale electric power prices. We've observed, observed this in a number of European countries. We've begun to observe it in the U.S. as well, as indicated by our analysis and many others. Over the longer term, however, new power plants come online and existing power plants retire. It may be the case that if you depress wholesale electricity prices, that some existing baseload plants, for example, whether coal or nuclear, will choose to retire. It may also be the case that new plants that are built are more likely to be intermediate or peaking gas generators rather than baseload coal generators. And it's that effect, the retirement of existing assets and shifting the type of new power plants that are built that leads to this decay of the effect. And so the question in terms of the, the pace of the, the decay or the speed with which that decay occurs ends up being a question about how sticky we think that power plant retirement decisions are and how long does it take for that wholesale price reduction to then affect new investment decisions. So let me leave it with that as kind of a broad response, and um, we can connect the, the questioner to Andrew Mills for more detailed follow-up. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Uh, so let's see, we've got a couple other uh, relatively quick questions here that uh, maybe some of them I can kind of click through. So one question uh, asks, is net metering included? Um, and so to answer that question, um, in short, um, our, the focus of this analysis is on state RPS programs. So we're not evaluating the benefits and impacts of net metering. We're evaluating the benefits and impacts of RPS programs. Um, that being said, some RPS programs allow net metered PV or other net metered renewable generation to count towards its RPS. Um, and in that case, we would uh, be capturing those net metered systems. We wouldn't necessarily be capturing all net metered systems, but only those systems that are, that are being used uh, for RPS compliance or that, that were being used uh, in the year 2013. Um, so that, that is the answer to that question. Um, there were a couple other maybe more logistical questions that I will answer. One is whether the 2016 study, um, where, where it will be available. Um, and I think probably the easiest answer to that question is that we will be posting it on our website um, and distributing it uh, via our email list. So if you want to be sure to, be, uh, to receive it when it's available, I'd encourage you just to uh, visit our website and, and sign up for our email distribution list. Um, Another question is uh, whether this webinar will be available um, uh, online. Yes, it's being recorded. We'll, we'll post a link to the recording shortly after the webinar. Um, uh, here another um, more substantive question. Um, 
how can we determine one state's, in this case Arizona, how can we determine one state's benefit from its RPS? Um, and, and I can take a stab at this question and then um, others can chime in if you like. And so this analysis, as, as Ryan mentioned, really was focused on looking at the aggregate impact of all RPS programs nationally. And of course, we, we break those impacts and benefits down uh, by state in many cases, but um, in those cases we're still really just looking at how those, um, those, the benefits of all programs combined um, are distributed uh, among the states. Um, so um, of course one could take the methods um, that we implemented in this study and apply them to an individual state. Um, and I, as Ryan mentioned on one of the introductory slides, indeed that was one of the main hopes of this study is that we could provide something of a, a model or a template or a starting point uh, for states that are interested in conducting these analyses of, of, of their own. Uh, Ryan or Jenny or others, any, any additional comments to add there before I move on? No, no, not really. I mean, obviously there isn't anything specifically in our analysis that allows one to do uh, what the questioner is asking for. Um, at the same time, if you are interested in conducting state-specific analyses, as Galen mentioned, we certainly hope that some of the tools and methods we've developed might be helpful. And I'm sure any of us would be happy to, to chat more with folks offline if they are interested in potentially employing some of these tools in a more state-specific context. Um, okay, let's see. We are kind of getting down to the end here. A few questions left. One uh, asks whether AVERT can calculate optimal renewable portfolio mix to achieve a GHG target with minimal net cost. Um, and the answer is no. That's, that's really not the kind of model that, that AVERT is. Um, it really just is focused on um, estimating the displacement of fossil generation from energy efficiency or renewable energy. But it's, it's not a capacity expansion model, so it, it doesn't simulate the construction of new generation or optimize um, any particular build-out schedule. Um, let's see here. Um, uh, another question is about the upcoming 2016 study, whether we'll examine the costs of integrating renewables into the grid. Um, and so this is, I think, really a question about the capabilities of the REEDS model that we'll be using as kind of the foundation for that analysis. Um, and Ryan or Jenny, do either of you guys want to hazard a, an answer to that question? Again, this is true live from NREL. I, I could take that. Um, so we will be using the NREL Regional Energy Deployment System model which, uh, and back to the earlier question, is a capacity expansion model that does calculate in, in some sense the optimal uh, portfolio going forward in, in time and, and RPSs uh, would be one of the drivers that would influence that um, optimal portfolio or at least will constrain what that optimal portfolio will look like. Um, the the REITS model is, is unique in one way is that we designed it specifically to capture at least some of the impacts of integrating renewables um, and the REITS model will also be the primary tool will be used to estimate costs of uh, such a portfolio. Um, and therefore, we are in taking into account some of these aspects, including you know, the need to build new transmission, uh, curtailments of renewables, and the need for you know, declining capacity value, and therefore the need to build other um, quote unquote you know, backup capacity or to provide additional operating reserves, et cetera. Uh, of course, as a model that looks out into the future over multiple decades, we don't have all of the resolution to examine all of the um, integration impacts. Um, so in, in some ways, it's not quite uh, complete there, but all of the major categories that affect the economics in particular will be considered um, in REITs. Okay, thanks, True. And so I think we're down to uh, really kind of the end of the, the line here. One, one final question, how did you estimate jobs numbers? Um, so um, I think I mean, Ryan did describe the, the JEDI um, and secondarily implant 
modeling that was done to estimate jobs. Um, I'm not sure what more specifically this um, question has in mind, but um, I would just encourage you to contact us if you'd like additional details beyond what was provided on the slides here. Um, let's see, we have one more question that just came in. Uh, you mentioned curtailing renewables. What about batteries? Um, and so I, I, I guess I would maybe mention, or well, just respond by saying that, that we didn't really, um, batteries were not really a, a central element to this study. Um, the AVERT model looks at the generation mix in um, 2013. Um, and so to the extent that, that batteries were deployed in that year, they would be sort of reflected in the um, resulting output from AVERT, but um, that was not really a, a central element in this study. So with that, I, I think we're, we're at the end of the line here. Um, and I guess I'll just repeat some of the closing remarks that Ryan made on the slide here. So um, the two web addresses at the top of this slide show where you can download the report, um, as well as the, this briefing, uh, a short fact sheet summarizing some of the key findings from this report. And we'll also be posting there a link to this webinar if you care to re-listen to it or um, um, see the, the specific set of slides that we've uh, presented here, which again are more or less identical to those that are already posted online. Um, again, you're welcome to reach out to any of us here if you have follow-up questions about this work. Uh, we welcome, welcome comments and questions, so please feel free. Um, and with that, I would just um, thank you all for, for joining us here. Uh, we've got more work uh, coming down the pike here shortly. So for those of you who are on our email lists, um, hopefully you'll see more work coming out in the next few weeks that will be uh, of interest. Um, and we will be having additional webinars on that work as, as, it, as it comes out. So with that, thank you all, and we'll see you next time.